Thank you for joining us today, guys. Today we are joined by Andrew Hallam. Uh, he's a modern day nomad uh, who has found a way to set up his life that works for him. Really excited to hear him share a little bit about his journey and some of uh, his experience and how he got to where he did today. So without further ado, Andrew, do you want to introduce yourself to the audience? Thanks for the, thanks for the invite first. Uh, I really appreciate that. Uh, so I was trained to be a school teacher. And that's what I did. I was teaching on Vancouver Island in Canada, in the uh, province of British Columbia. And I was doing two things concurrently from the very beginning, from when the, I started my, my teaching career. Was, I was also writing personal finance articles for magazines and newspapers, that sort of thing. So I was really inspired to do, to do two things. I think one was really, I guess I was really inspired to do one thing, Liam, that was just to live the best life I could. To figure out how to do that. And I was talk, chatting with you before I ended up taking a year off from my high school teaching job, and then eventually ended up moving to Singapore, and uh, got a job at a, a large international school. And in the meantime, I continued to write personal finance articles for magazines and newspapers. And, and then in 2011, I, while still at Singapore American School, I wrote a book called Millionaire Teacher, which I was very fortunate to uh, to have hit number one on Amazon USA for business and investing in the United States um, and in Canada. So I was absolutely thrilled about that. Stayed at the job because I loved it. We had we just had such a great time teaching uh, high school English. And then I also taught personal finance. And then in 2014, my wife said, let's take a year off. Let's take a break. And so we decided we'd do that. We'd leave the jobs. And one year led to two, which has led to seven and I guess going on eight now. So yeah, we've really enjoyed just the, the traveling and meeting new people, the picking up pieces of different languages and different cultures. And, uh, and I've continued to write along the way. So anywhere there's a Wi-Fi connection for me, there's, uh, yeah, there's, there's an income stream. And I enjoy it, it just keeps me thinking. Uh, I really enjoy that process of, uh, of writing and communicating. And I speak uh, globally about personal finance and financial wellness. So that's one thing that wasn't really by design, Liam. It was one of these things where somebody asked me to do it at one point. And my wife and I had done a, I'd done a few of them in Singapore and in Thailand, but I hadn't given a lot of these talks. And then at one point we were cycling around Europe on our tandem and, you know, we've got our panniers and we're, we're riding through Slovenia and that, and I had been posting the pictures on Facebook about where we were and what we were doing and telling little stories about people we've met along the way. And then friends who had previously worked in Singapore who are now working at different schools throughout Europe started contacting me and saying, can you come and give a talk? And so eventually, you know, it was just one of these, it was one of these weird things where, you know, this cycling touring thing became this speaking cycling thing. And, and I wasn't dressed. I mean, I was wearing just, you know, a t-shirt and, pair of shorts or ratty light pants, anything that could fit lightly into the, into the panniers I could stuff into the panniers. So I ended up giving all, all these talks and eventually it just, uh, it started to become, um, I guess, really in demand. So in 2017 or 2018, for example, there was a, a six month stretch where I spoke at 90, at 90 different places. So business, international businesses, um, international schools, 14 different countries in just a six month period. And I was just accepting all of these speaking gigs, um, which kept us really busy. We met loads of different people. And in one sense, it became the catalyst for the, uh, the book that I will be re releasing in January called Balance. Fascinating. Can you share a little bit, obviously you're traveling a lot, you're all over the globe. What does kind of a, a modern day nomad mean to you? What does that look like in reality? For us, it depends. It, for us, we are you asking about me specifically or what we actually see from other people? I guess I can just speak. Yeah, no first. more from you specifically, right? So where uh, we're, I'm taking this, right, is essentially help the audience understand what your lifestyle is today mm. and then kind of work backwards to say, Okay, how did you set the structure up, right, to allow you yeah. to do what you do today? You know, what we did was 
we we decided like what are the things that, that we want to do during a year off or two years off and that, that's how it started so you know we got a big white piece of paper and we started drawing writing down the things that we wanted so let's spend a few months in spain and let's maybe get a a camp rise van and travel through north america so we put this kind of this wish list of things together and then figured well life is short let's just make these things happen and some of them worked out as planned and then other things you know another idea would come in and we would grab that and run with it it was one i think one of the more interesting was we bought a, a winnebago travado it's a, a 21 foot long uh camper van like a class b van kind of like a mercedes sprinter and we decided we would drive this thing <clears throat> from Canada to Argentina. And we spent 17 months in this thing. And we had no set plan in terms of where we were going to be or when. And we just explored. So we went down the West Coast, the west Western part of the US, and several of the national parks there, which were amazing. We went into Mexico and spent 10 months exploring Mexico which is an incredibly diverse country. And then we went into Guatemala and Belize and El Salvador. And, and meanwhile, um, I mentioned that I was giving these financial talks. So what would be happening is I would get these requests and my wife would have to organize them because I'm completely disorganized. She would corral the requests into sort of five week chunks. And so there might be a bunch of requests coming from, let's say, <clears throat> let's say Europe. So she'd say, all right, well, we'll say we'll speak in Europe and the Middle East during this particular five week period. And so we'd store the van <clears throat> in Mexico or Guatemala. And we just pray it'd still be there when we get back. And we'd fly off. I'd, I'd be giving these financial wellness talks at, at banks or international schools or insurance companies or resort chains. And then we'd fly back after five weeks of just giving a series of talks. And the contrast was what we found so amazing. So, you know, we're having dinner with a CEO of a, of a large company in, let's say, Dubai. And everything is glitz and glamour. And the people were interesting and we really enjoyed that. And then, you know, we'd fly back to Guatemala at the end of a stint there and we'd be sitting around a campfire just a day or two later with a family of Argentinians raising their kids on the road in an RV as they played music and took videos that they sold to media outlets in Argentina which fueled their travels and their lifestyle and it was just this awesome variety that this gave us that I thought in so many ways, began to question what it was that people are, are generally really striving for. So when you and I were chatting earlier, you know, you were talking about how often there's a, a high level or you saw a high level of dysfunction among these people who are conventionally very successful. And, and I would see that. And then I would go back to hanging out with these Argentinians in their RV. And I'd ask myself, okay, wait, who smiles more? Who laughs more? Who spends more time with their kids? Who seems to be more successful on a holistic element here? I mean, anything that we choose to do in life, um, we choose to do for the purpose of our own life satisfaction. Like ask anyone why they do anything. And eventually it boils down to, I think it'll make me happy. It's about life satisfaction. But many people end up pursuing money career, title, job, at the expense of so many of these other factors, which are so much, arguably so much more important. And so, uh, yeah, it's been, it's been a really fascinating journey for me. You would know much better than I, but I think, uh, isn't it once you read a, a cert certain average income of like 70,000, like incremental happiness above that <laughs> for money is, is negligible, I believe, right? Um, that's yeah forget what it is right once you cover essentially those essentials um if you're deriving happiness from money you're going to be very disappointed yeah it's interesting that you know that was based on um the easterland paradox is what it was called and 
other studies have been replicated. And of course, there have been adjustments for inflation. But yeah, generally in the United States, that income level is about $105,000 a year. And beyond that point, there's very little life satisfaction that's, that's added. In fact, there's a downward trend. There's an interesting Purdue-based study suggesting that that trend actually starts to head downward after about $160,000 a year. And the theory behind that is those people tend to work harder. They spend more time working. They spend less time with their families. They spend more time in a stress-oriented atmosphere. And so it, their life satisfaction ends up dropping. But, you know, the funny thing about that whole, that whole figure, though, is that life satisfaction and happiness is very relative. You can look at those studies and you can see, okay, in the United States, it seems to, you know, generally happiness in terms of the wealth comparison hits a satiation point at about $105,000 a year. That so depends on where you are because it's so relative. Like if you look at that $105,000 nationally, you know, it's about, I don't know, 40 to 50% above the median household income. Okay, so nationally that makes sense. But then you move to a place like Portola Valley, California, where $105,000 a year puts you in the poor house. And so anyone around them, you can't afford a mortgage on that or a down payment to save up for a down payment on a home when the median home values are, you know, $4.8 million. And so that's another fascinating element when it comes to life satisfaction and that depending on where we are, uh, that figure can, can actually shift. That makes a lot of sense. Um, I joke that, you know, if I had been born into a family in Baja, California, where the goal was, life satisfaction and you know you're fishing and taking care of the family right like all these priorities are very different uh then and that medium income number is very different right uh based on the location uh as well um so that's something i always go through in my mind right as i'm trying to determine uh where we're deriving that happiness when there's so many constant pressures that are put on us uh to do things differently than, uh, you know, what might actually achieve that happiness for us. So, um, so you talked about this incredible journey that you and your wife are on and you're traveling all over the place. Um, at the same time, you know, you were a teacher, you're a teacher in Singapore, which as we're talking about localizations, I believe is one of the higher cost of living areas. Uh, how traveling is expensive, right? Like how, how did you set yourself up uh, to be able to, to do that uh, and be in a place where uh, you, you know, could take a year off? When I was 19, I met a mechanic uh, while I was working a part-time job to pay for my college education. And he was a self-made millionaire and he had built his wealth through stock and bond market investments and real estate. And one day he sat down and he started to explain to me how, how I could best use money to actually work less and save less money over my lifetime than somebody else who isn't financially literate. And so for me, it was really simple. I was, I was lazy. And so this really did, did attract me to the idea that money could compound so that I could use it. So when I was 19, I started to invest money in the stock market and just continued to add money every single month. And I, it was funny because in the beginning, he says, you've got to start with at least $100 a month and you've got to start today. And I'm 19 and I said to him, like, Russ, I, I don't have 100 bucks. Like, you know, right now I've got the student loan that's starting to grow. And he says, no, you've got to establish this habit now. And he says, you've got 100 a month, I know it, because I've watched you go over to that vending machine and I've watched you buy like a can of Coke and a bag of chips out of that thing. And he says, do the math, college boy. Like if you go there and you're buying that stuff, you're spending close to $100 a month on crap during your working shift. And so I thought about that and went, gosh, I guess he's, I guess he's right. And so that was the start, Liam. It was just really, really simple, adding money every month. And then as I earned more money, I started to invest more money. I was, I was lucky in that I, I understood early on that there wasn't, that material acquisitions don't tend to boost our life satisfaction. It was just something that early on in life, I caught on to that, that reality. And all sorts of fascinating studies that I brought up in my book, Balance, end up 
sort of talking about that and referencing that, that, you know, when we spend money on experiences, especially with people we love, this augments our level of life satisfaction. But you know, research suggests that the new iPhone or the, the brand new car or the, big, the new big TV set, it's just stuff that we get used to. So we end up, it's called hedonic adaptability. We get used to this stuff and really, really early on. And so that was money that instead of buying all of those things, it was money that I invested. And so by the time, despite the fact that I was a teacher, by the time I was in my mid thirties, uh, I was already financially independent. So, you know, the idea of being able to withdraw an inflation adjusted three or 4% uh, in perpetuity off my investment portfolio uh, was the reality by the time I was in my mid thirties. And so at this stage, we're not actually withdrawing that money. I, I've made some withdrawals to buy some things for other people, which has been really exciting for me. So uh, we bought, my mom and dad don't have a lot of money and never did, but we were super excited to buy them a, a Mercedes RV. And we were jazzed, like it was better than anything we'd buy for, ours, for ourselves, but it was just this thing that uh, it gave us so much more satisfaction. It's such a thrill to, to buy this thing for my mom and dad that they never could afford. Uh, so yeah, it's been, it's been exciting at this stage, other than a couple of big withdrawals from the account to purchase things like that to actually give to people. We've been able to live on my writing income. So you know, I write a weekly column for a financial services company in Texas called Asset Builder. Uh, and I write for a, a company called Swiss Quote in Luxembourg. And then uh, I've got a column that I write occasionally, about once a month for the Globe and Mail, which is Canada's national newspaper. So yeah, we've been financially independent for quite a while. We have that money that's a nest egg that just continues to grow and should continue to grow over time. Uh, but at this stage, we're just trying to enjoy life, the, the, get us soak as much out of life as we can. That's pretty cool. Diving into some of the executional elements, Andrew, uh, obviously you started and you just put it in the stock market. Uh, I'm assuming you either pick something or put it in an indices. Um, Kind of how did that strategy evolve over time, right? And what are the things that, you know, uh, do you use a financial advisor who allocates for you? Is it something that you're doing in terms of, you know, finding that diversification? And, you know, what are your big buckets that you would say, you know, make sure to hit these uh, to make sure that you're, you know, outstripping inflation and you have that compounding interest at play? Yeah, that's a really good question. And, you know, when I first started out, you know, I walked into a bank and I said, hey, can we, you know, I, I want to be investing my money. So they got me into a series of mutual funds, actively managed funds. And not long after that, I figured out the costs associated with those were, were going to erode my long-term returns. So as you know, if you are paying one and a half percent a year in mutual fund fees, and in Canada, it was actually two and a half percent. Now, this can literally be the difference between you having you know, $500,000 and a million dollars at the end of a 30-year period. So you know, money can compound for you and it can compound against you. So I got into then reading as much as I could about Warren Buffett and how he picks individual stocks. I started to invest um, buying individual stocks and then realized that, you know, I probably can't beat the market. And so I started to purchase uh, ETFs and then built a diversified portfolio, a very boring globally diversified portfolio of ETFs. And, and if you're living in the United States, it's, it's super easy. Just you could purchase a Vanguard life strategy fund, which is fully globally diversified. And each of those obviously has a different allocation of stocks and bonds. So you can go higher risk with higher stock allocation or lower risk with a slightly higher bond allocation and do nothing. Just keep adding money to it. You don't have to follow the stock market. You don't have to follow the economy or economic news. It just uh, keep adding money through thick and thin through ups and downs, and eventually continue to do that, and you're consistent with that, uh, yeah, eventually you will build financial freedom. So it's a, it's a slower process than you know, starting a business and having that absolutely rock, uh, but it's also, uh, it's also tried to do true tested system too. Have you added any different strategies over time, or has it had been just consistent in terms of Find something that, you know, broadly mirrors the market that gives you the most diversification and will kind of grow at that steady compounding return over time. I've actually gone to the point where I've, I've simplified further versus making things a bit more complicated. So 
yeah, just I haven't added any alternative strategies and haven't really felt the need to. Um, so it's interesting because, of course, I know that with a diversified portfolio of stock and bond market index funds, just set it and forget it. My portfolio will and does outperform most college endowment funds, which go for all kinds of alternative strategies, uh, likewise hedge funds as well. So, so I know that I'm going to be in the 90th percentile in terms of professionally managed money just by doing this super simple thing and then getting on with my life. So that's what I like about it. Sort of we have peer reviewed academic data to suggest that this is how we can be in the 90th percentile of professionally managed money on a risk adjusted basis over your lifetime. And so for me, it's like, oh, well, that's good enough for me. If I'm in the 90th percentile and I can get along with you know, get on with other things in life, exploring places, making new friends, meeting new people. Uh, to, for me, that's, uh, that's where it's at. Nice. So let's walk that back a step then. So you, you talked about having that three, three to 4% return, inflation adjusted. How did you get to knowing what that target number was to be financially independent and kind of what went into that equation for you? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. What I, what I noticed, um, so when we look at back-tested studies on a diversified portfolio, uh, back-tested studies suggest, and, and a back-tested study back to 1926, so it'll include the stock market crash of 1929, the market crash of 1973-74, you know, the one the short-term crash of 2007, and then, of course, the crash of uh, 2000 to 2002, and then 2008-2009. Research suggests that you can withdraw an inflation adjusted 4% per year and you have high odds of that money uh, lasting at least a 30 year retirement duration. And so that's what I did was looked at that and figured, well, what, what is it that I can live on if I were actually retired and had no other income? And so years ago, I figured out how much I figured that would be. And then what I did was uh, I did an adjustment for inflation. So I figured, okay, you know, I'm not there yet. So this would have been in my 20s. I'm saying, well, I'm not there yet. I'm not at the point where, you know, let's say that number was a million dollars and I can't remember what it was, but let's just say it was a million dollars. And I figured, well, I'm not, I'm not there yet, but that million dollars in 15 years time is not going to have the same buying power. So what's it going to be worth if inflation averages, let's say 3% per year. And so let's say I calculated that out at, I don't know, 1.8 million. So 1.8 million now becomes a goal for financial freedom. So sort of looking at a backwards design, now working forward to invest as much money as I could, I wasn't one of these people that said, I'm going to earn definitively a 9% return or an 8% return because I know that there's so many unpredictable variables there. And so for me, it was a matter of, I'm going to invest as much as I comfortably can. If I reach that goal before uh, this 15 year period, or 10 year period or whatever it was, or if I reached the, that goal after, those aren't elements that I can control. But the only things I can control uh, are my perspective, hopefully my emotions, and how much I'm actually saving and putting away into the investment portfolio. That's awesome. And then it, it sounds like you were just diligent for with that plan and with that savings for many years to get to that point where you could just say, let's take a sabbatical yeah yeah it's 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 nice to be in that in that place where you know having that financial freedom to to choose to work or not to work um another thing too about you know the traveling and, and people listening to this might think oh the guy's traveling full time well that's got to be really expensive it, it's something that a lot of people refer to as geographical arbitrage which it which is pretty exciting in that so right now I'm in, I'm in Panama City and we're renting a place for $56 a night. And it's a, it's a penthouse apartment with three bedrooms, three bathrooms. We've got this fabulous, fabulous deck and a view of the ocean. It's just this, uh, it's just something that you could not get in Seattle or you could not get in Vancouver you could not, for that kind of price. So the idea that we can continue to earn money in country A, but spend time in country B is, is unbelievable. It's one of those things where so many people, if they, if once they recognize that, they could say, well, maybe I don't need as much money as I think I need to be financially independent. All I need to give up is potentially Seattle's rain in the winter or the snow of Chicago in the winter. 
And man, if I'm willing to sacrifice and spend like four months a year in Costa Rica, I could actually retire a lot earlier or be financially independent earlier anyway. Yeah, it's really challenging yourself to get rid of some of those stake points, right? That uh, have you anchored to certain thought processes or locations, right? That uh, yeah. bind you there. Do you happen to have a view of all the ships queuing up to go through the uh, canal? If I, if I look far to the right, I can just see the tail end of those. Yeah. Have you been to yeah. Panama City? I have. And uh, it was amazing to me flying out and seeing all the queue of all the ships uh, that are just looking to get through. Uh, and what an amazing transportation highway that really is, quite frankly. Um, but um, I digress. Uh, it gets me excited for my... Uh, from my times traveling, very jealous of where you're at today. Um, as we wrap up here, Andrew, any kind of last pieces of uh, advice or wisdom that you would give the audience as, you know, they're trying to think through how they set up their life and, you know, a lot of them have their own businesses uh, and kind of how they, you know, where they go or steps they should take to uh, reach financial freedom. You know, there's one thing, Liam, that I've been thinking of more and more. So, I, I never understood years ago why Warren Buffett would continue to work. And, and it, I just didn't get it. You know, he was a multimillionaire in his early 30s. He's a billionaire today. You know, he gives away more money every year to charity than, than, than Donald Trump's actually worth. I mean, he gives away about almost $4 billion a year to charity. He's been doing that every year. So, I mean, he's, been give, he's given away, I think last count is something like 45 or $46 billion, but the dude continues to work. And, and that's not me. It's not something that I'd ever want to do, but now I get it. So when looking at life expectancies of people, my advice now to people is never fully quit. Like keep your hand in something forever. It's good for your brain. It gives you a sense of purpose. Research suggests that those who actually stop working earlier actually die earlier. And so, you know, so many people have this dream where I'm going to work my butt off to attain financial independence so that I can play golf and have fun and travel and drink margaritas all over the world. But in essence, this isn't the thing that we actually need. For life satisfaction, we need to continue to work. And so that work can be part-time. So you have a business and let's say you sell that business, but you continue to have a hand in it some way, shape or form so that you keep your mind, keep your mind active. Um, just the sense of that activity has you engaging with different age demographics as you get older as well, which is really great for your brain studies suggesting that it helps to ward off things like dementia and Alzheimer's. And it actually keeps you physically happier or and, sorry, physically healthier. And that, that as a result, uh, was results of that is actual life satisfaction and happiness too. And that's something that so few people talk about, Liam, because we look at this, this goal at the end of the rainbow, where we think at this point is that's the stage where I'm financially independent, where I, you know, I hang it up and I do nothing, uh, but that's actually not productive. Yeah, I think it's the something that I'm trying to set up in my own life is mirroring this um, financial independence with lifestyle design, right? To essentially say, have the optionality, but at the same time, right? Uh, I'm one of those people who will likely work in some capacity, right? But I also don't want to kill myself now to have X, Y, Z in the future, right? How do you blend them? uh in the immediate term right to maximize utility going back to my wonderful econ days right uh in the moment right instead of delaying all of that in hopes of uh you know something better in the future which as you articulated doesn't really help uh actually declines uh that uh, happiness which is yeah i like to say like uh, keep one eye on today and the other eye on tomorrow because tomorrow may never come that's like true. Every, every one of us is like, you know, there's a dark, I, I look at it this way. Life is like a dark hourglass and you can't see the sand and it gets tipped at birth. You can't see how much sand you have left. And so you, you have to also really live for the moment. Mm, that makes sense. Um, as we're closing out here, Andrew, what's the best way for the audience to be able to connect back with you? 
Um, at my, my website at andrewhallam.com. And, uh, and I have a new book coming out January 18th and pre-orders are available now. And I'm pretty excited about that. It's called Balance, How to Invest and Spend for Happiness, Health and Wealth. Very cool. Well, I appreciate the time, Andrew. I appreciate your insights uh, that you were sharing today and look forward to staying connected. Yeah, likewise, Liam. Thanks. Thanks very much. It was nice to learn about you as well. We had a pretty good chat before this, uh, this episode started. I appreciate that. Yeah, I love those dialogues. Thanks, Andrew.